All right, here we are again, lecture number five. This will be the longest of our lectures, and we're going to jump in and do more about the process of spatial thinking. Okay, so this is part of the Science Aware or How to Think Spatially lecture series. I'm Russ Congleton, and I'm uh, glad that you've joined us. So thanks for being here. Let's do a little review and see what we understand so far about spatial thinking. So we, we know that it varies in character and it varies in operation, that it's based on disciplines, they're based on uh, things that we understand from our lives, our life experience. Uh, and so it can appear in many flavors and varieties. Some parts of spatial thinking are better for one task than for another task. And we also know that some people excel in one facet of spatial thinking and not in another, okay? So hopefully, again, you're increasing your awareness of this and you're seeing what's going on, okay? We do know, however, that ability increases with experience. So thank you for hanging in there and going through these lectures and through the exercises because you're increasing your experience and therefore you're going to do better in general as a spatial thinker, but you can also work on doing this in a specific domain knowledge in a specific discipline. For example, you get better at finding tumors on x-rays the more you practice. That's why we train doctors. That's why they have internships, okay? And again, same thing, it comes with experience. In inferring the presence of oil-bearing strata in a geological cross-section. Yep, it takes practice, takes increased spatial thinking. Here's one we can all rate, relate to, right? Imagining 3D shapes from 2D drawings. And again, you had to do that to some extent in uh, exercise number one that you did. So hopefully these are ringing a bell for you. So let's look at the framework that we've been talking about, right? So spatial thinking depends on this interplay between these mental representations that capture what we're seeing in the real world, capture these features or, or we've been calling objects. And then once we have these representations of these objects, we transform them um, so that we get some uh, intelligence out of that, some representation that makes sense to us to solve whatever problem we're trying to do with our spatial thinking. Okay. And so the framework is formed by a bunch of these different elements, and we've talked through most of these already. So there's properties of that representation, both static, one point in time, and dynamic, changing over time. There's properties of the transformation, whether we do that um, physically or we do that mentally. Okay. There's the process of complex spatial reasoning which gets us to those answers what why, why we're doing this is to um, better understand what's going on but better able to reason out the solution to the situation or the problem that we're dealing with there's distortions that occur sometimes good sometimes those little outliers help us sometimes it messes us up sometimes we're not able to generalize because the distortion throws us off. We need to start thinking uh, in abstract domains, okay, so beyond the, the practical, that's important. Um, we get to the point where we're using external um, diagrammatic representations versus internal mental representations. So again, we're doing this either physically, maybe with our hands, maybe drawing something versus doing it in our heads. I don't know, I think of uh, Rubik's Cube as a way of, of you know, doing it in our with our hands versus, you know, me mentally doing that in our head. And then we're linking things between levels of expertise and our ability to actually spatial think, right? So all those things are kind of part of this framework. And so we talked about representations. When we're talking about representations, we're, we're meaning the properties of the entity or the object that we're looking at. And as we've already said, 
that can be in our mind, it can be imaginary, or or it can be external. It could be physical, something that we can touch or something that we can see. And it allows us to map these elements, these objects and their relationships so that we can relate what's going on to what we're trying to do in the real world, right? It, it's kind of a model, right? We're not often able to do every component of that, but we're trying to relate what we're seeing to what's going on um, in, in the real world. Okay? Of course, that's that's where we live. Makes total sense. Okay, And so those representations consist of those elements or those objects, and then those uh, spatial relationships among those objects with respect to some frame of reference, right? Everything has to be in, in some kind of context. And one of the key components of spatial thinking is taking those real world objects and encoding them into something that we can then either mentally manipulate or physically manipulate, right? So we call that encoding of the attributes of the spatial world. And so when we're going to encode those attributes, when we're going to try to represent that, we have to understand that our ability to encode is not perfect. Okay, We get distortions in the encoding process. And because of that, that can cause us some issues. Last time we talked about, you know, some pattern recognition and generalization and classification and you know, those things can get messed up if we have distortions or issues in our encoding. And so, for example, the location of an entity or an object is encoded with respect to other objects, right? So you look, you don't look at things and say, okay, I'm just looking at this object and I don't care about anything else. You, you have them in terms of a relationship with or context of everything that's around it or with some frame of reference. But that frame of reference might have only a relative accuracy and not an absolute accuracy. And so that's gonna cause some distortions. Okay. And which objects we attribute, what we, what we give encoding for, for those objects, which attributes we pick depends on the specific task or objective and your level of experience or expertise with spatial thinking, okay? And we're gonna have a great exercise at the end of this lecture that's really gonna bring some of this out. So you almost might wanna watch this lecture, do the exercise and then come back and watch this again. Um, I think it'll give you lots of context, which is the key thing. That's why we've got the exercises and um, the lecture material. Okay. So spatial thinking begins with distinguishing and encoding these spatial features, right? Relating what we're seeing so that we can deal with them. So first we got to identify what that feature is or what that object is. Okay. And then we need to identify it. So we go, okay, there it is. Okay. What is it? Okay. Then Relations between those features need to be recognized. And then finally, their context, so you can put it all together. So it sounds like it's step by step by step, but it's really, your brain does this incredibly quickly and you don't even really understand or realize that you're doing that, but you are, okay? And so the encoding process steps, you know, here for just for an example, you know, you distinguish some feature on the ground, you recognize the pattern, maybe the shape, the outline, maybe something about the internal patterns that are there. You go, okay, what's the size of this thing? That's typically contextual in relationship to other things. Is it bigger than a car? Is it smaller than a car? Is it the size of a football field? You know, what, what's going on? You look at its texture, is it smooth? Is it rough? Is it is it uh, wiggly? You got the color, okay? And any other things that you particularly notice about that, okay? And again, the more you think spatially, the more different attributes you'll, you'll come up with, okay? And again, as I just said, you know, those steps aren't really separate. You Your brain 
is well trained at doing this and it kind of puts it all together boom 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 and you're, you're there okay and so results from prior information processing serve as components for more complex spatial judgment and inferences what, what does that sentence mean it means the more you practice this the more you've done this the more experience that you have the better you'll get at it because you will go through those simple steps very quickly and get to that last step where you look at additional attributes okay it also what you see and what you process what you encode varies depending on the problem you're trying to solve okay and the, the person who's trying to solve it so we all have different biases we all have different experiences um it actually can change day to day to day it could change in the morning you had too much coffee and you're just not on your game or maybe you didn't have enough coffee you didn't get enough sleep the night before those things can change how we perceive um and 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 are able to do our spatial thinking hopefully that makes sense to you okay so again here's some examples and this is really going to lead up to us doing the exercise number three but first thing we want to do is distinguish the feature you know from the ground right you want to see what's going on there okay so that's the kind of the first step and again usually we don't think much about that except in in some rare circumstances like on a foggy night i don't know if you've ever driven in the fog and you can't really see and now you become hyper intense on looking at all the different spatial features and you know you just really kind of zone into that because it's scary um to drive in the fog and obviously you wouldn't want to hit a deer or you know somebody crossing the street or uh, you know somebody else or another car you know I don't know if you've had that experience or not but also here's another example seeing an x-ray you know for the very first time so here's an x-ray and you go oh, oh my goodness I had no idea that you know this is obviously a dog um, and you can see the bones in the dog's tail and you go oh well, that's cool but if you've never seen this before you know you, you might ask well what, what am i looking at and you might need some help with that okay the other image is the an image of the pentagon okay and so some things are really really easy i think if you asked almost everybody in the world what's this a picture of they would say the pentagon why because it's shaped like a pentagon okay so some things are, are, are just easy right and and it only takes maybe one attribute to identify what what's going on there okay so pattern recognition is all part of this right you first you kind of figure out okay i've identified i've located I, i've separated something from the ground and now i'm going to try to recognize examples of of what's going on with this okay so pattern recognition is absolutely key for everyday life as well as you know if you want to be a bi biologist or you want to be a geographer or you want to be an engineer or you want to be a, a planner or you want to be uh whatever okay every discipline you know needs pattern recognition but it's absolutely key critical for everyday life right you, you got to recognize a friend you know how do you recognize a friend when you see their face you know whatever okay reading if we couldn't recognize letters that's pattern recognition you know you wouldn't be able to read and if you have uh you know there's different uh situations uh, somebody might be dyslexic and have a hard time um they they train themselves differently for different kinds of pattern recognition and they get help with that but it's also very domain specific right so there's an example below that shows um some fault lines on an image that happens to be in southern california where there's lots of earthquakes and so a geologist would look at this and immediately recognize the earthquake fault lines okay or if you were a mathematician or a, a math student you know you you see that equation on the side on the right hand side there and you, you see that big summation sign okay and you go okay i know what that means and then you know okay 
k equals one that's where i start so i'm starting with the number one and i'm going through um, the value n and i'm going to do a to the k values so i'm going to do that n number of times whatever that means i'm going to sum all those values of a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4 all the way up to um, a n okay so you understand that that's pretty simple stuff so pattern recognition absolutely key okay evaluating the size of something okay again absolutely essential for life for navigation for for packing your suitcase for rearranging furniture you know hopefully you're making these examples real to you and you're seeing what's going on obviously there's a little picture here in science you know size is so important for different disciplines and so we've got the blue whale the biggest um animal in the world and we've got dinosaurs on there and then we've got us down there pretty small compared to everything else so we've got scale here right size super important and then things like texture okay? and textures are clues to depth and distance they're helpful in object recognition they're a clue on how something should be handled or interpreted okay and so i show a porcupine obviously you don't want to put your hand down on top of the porcupine we understand the texture there is is very very rough very very sharp the other photograph is that of a uh, forest and i you know you can think of putting your hand down on top of that and you can see that the tree crowns are, are kind of soft and billowy and i would say that you go ah you know you're, you put your hand on top of that it's like almost like like touching a, a a nice big woolly sheep and so texture you know is super important in pattern recognition and understanding uh what's going on color color is a big deal right and so uh, again there's an image there that shows a flower in the visible portions of the electromagnetic spectrum so what our eyes can see essentially blue green and red portions of light of electromagnetic energy but then there's um, a picture of a flower in ultraviolet we don't our eyes can't see in ultraviolet um, but different animals especially insects bees and others can uh, either um, see things in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum or some in the infrared portion of the spectrum and that you can see that that part of the flower is really being emphasized that um, needs that bee to come and pollinate and cross pollinate and and you know get this stuff all over their wings and go from flower to flower okay so pretty interesting and then the, the other circle on the uh, right hand side is actually a color blindness test and uh, lots and lots of males are colorblind not that they don't see any colors at all, but they don't see all the colors or the same colors. Are there some confusion between colors? Um, most males that are colorblind are what's called red-green colorblind. And if you can see a number in there, you're probably not colorblind, but I can tell you that I am colorblind and I can't see the, I can't see the number. So you'd have to tell me what it is. So color is important, right? We're, we're recognizing what these objects look like, okay? So let me remind you again, we've got this framework, right? So the framework for spatial thinking depends, again, on this interplay between us capturing a, some kind of representation of what we're seeing and then being able to transform those representations into something that's meaningful. And we do that through these different elements where we either we represent the properties of the object both static and dynamic we represent those transformations either through um, physical or external stimuli or through mental representation we try to get to a process where we're reasoning about that we're not just thinking anymore but we're actually taking it the next step we're well aware of the distortions that can occur that mess up our spatial thinking. We want to be able to do this in an abstract sense in some cases. And we want to link 
we understand that there's a linkage between how good we are at doing this and our process. Okay, so don't forget about this framework. We've gone through this and then I've shown you some examples and then we've gone through it again. Okay, so again, let's look at some representations. Here, we're gonna just start with um, static. So one point in time, not changing over time. So we use spatial judgment, things like size, shape, distance, pattern, tone, texture, all these different things that we've looked at. And they're um, not evaluations of properties of entities, but rather relate the entity so, to some frame of reference. Okay, so it's important to understand that those spatial judgments that we have, those things are important, but they're really not evaluating the property typically. They're trying to relate it to the frame of reference around us. Okay, so for instance, the, the we have an object and it's upright. Okay, how do we know it's upright? How do we know it's standing up? Okay, well, that's in, in terms of frame of reference of something else. Or that glass is closer to me than the pitcher. Okay, so the pitcher has water in it, the glass has water in it, the glass is closer. Okay, that, that's helping me understand, you know, the frame of reference. And so it's important that we have these spatial evaluations and comparisons. So we do things like determining, we determine orientation, is it upright? We determine the location, is it closer? We assess that distance. I think it's within a hand reach distance, or I think it's six feet away. Okay, and then we do some comparing with that. What's the size? What's the shape? What's the color? What's the texture? What's the direction? What other attributes that we need to have? Okay, and this is all quite simple. It may sound like I'm giving you a whole bunch of complex things to, to think about. I'm just trying to increase your awareness, but understand that when you start doing like exercise number three, all this is going to come together. And the more you can make it come together, uh, the better you'll do. Okay. So here's some examples, putting a picture on a wall. Okay. Or telling the letter M from the letter W. Some might have trouble with that. They look very similar. One is upside down from the other, right? Or identifying molecules in chemistry or identifying rock strata in geology or identifying light sources in a building design. All of those take this combination of things that we've been talking about. Sometimes one, uh, one entity or one description or one object more than the others, okay? What about when we get dynamic? Okay, so the issue is that, you know, if everything was static, it would be a lot easier, but it's, but it's not, our world's dynamic, right? So our minds need to find ways to encode, interpret, and represent not only objects that are standing still or static, but moving objects. Okay. And again, this is typically done with respect to some kind of frame of reference or in relationship to other entities or other objects that we're looking at. And so these dynamic features, these features that are moving, these objects that are moving have to be evaluated and they can be evaluated in at least these four ways. And uh, direction of movement, <laughs> I wrote here that that's critical for survival, right? If you're standing there and the bear is running at you, you better know that the bear is running at you because if you don't do something about that, that's not going to be good. If the bear is running away, that's a much better, better scenario, right? We also have to understand the manner of motion, speed or acceleration. Again, how could we drive a car or whatever if we didn't do that? And then obviously intersection or collision. So I think hopefully you can think how critical all those features are, all those dynamic features are, and your evaluation of them as part of your spatial thinking. Okay. Then we need to transform those representations, right? So it's not just, okay, now I know what it is. It's going the distance. It's going further with that. Okay, so being able to transform that enables us or helps us to establish these mental representations of the spatial world. Okay. And so the powerful component of spatial thinking is this ability to transform, manipulate, operate, 
on these objects, on these representations. Okay, and so again, here are some examples to predict the time and place of arrival by mentally extrapolating a path of movement. For some reason, I'm really good at this. You know, I will call my wife and I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm flying in from California. I fly into, into Boston. I have to drive up to New Hampshire. And um, I say, okay, I'll be home. I'll be home at nine o'clock. And pretty much plus or minus probably 10 minutes. Uh, I am now, obviously sometimes something happens, a huge accident or traffic jam or, you know, some situation, but those are, those are cool things to be able to do or determine if an object will fit in a room or fit in a dishwasher or a suitcase by mentally rotating things around. Okay. That, that makes total sense, right? Or detect a trend by mentally extending a line on a graph. Okay. This is not a physical one. This is a mental one. Okay. So all those examples hopefully help you understand what we're talking about, where we're transforming these representations of these objects or entities that we're looking at okay and it can get more complex than that so a little bit more about these transformations or manipulations that we're doing they're they're a basis for inference they're a basis for prediction and they're certainly a basis basis for creativity okay so Spatial thinking is elementary to scientific reason. Without it, we're not really going to comprehend new situations and be able to cre be creative and come up with new ideas. Okay. So hopefully you're seeing that as you're getting more aware here. But here's a list of some, not all, but some different kinds of spatial transformations. And again, some of these you've done with Tetris. Some of you these you've done with the Exercise number one. So changing the perspective, getting a different frame of reference or changing the orientation, rotating the object in your hand physically or rotating the object mentally in your mind, transforming the shape, changing the size, making it bigger, moving other objects, moving the object around, reconfiguring parts of the object, definitely zooming in and out to get more detail, less detail. And acting or panning, moving through the object. Again, this is just a short list, but these are ways that we do move things most of the time mentally, sometimes physically. I don't know about you, but I've moved the furniture in my um, porch up in my place in Maine many, many times <laughs> to see how it fits best. I like to do that in my head, but there's someone in my family who likes me to move the furniture around. <laughs> I think you know what I'm saying there. All right. So let's, let's, we, we keep talking about this idea of spatial reasoning and spatial reasoning is a component of spatial thinking, but it kind of lets us put all these things together because we can get better and better and better at our spatial thinking ability which is going to improve our spatial reasoning. Okay. And it says here that the process of spatial reasoning most often becomes a complex one because we combine a bunch of our spatial thinking together. Okay. We may have several representations, which allows us to do different comparisons, which results in multiple transformations of those objects so that we can kind of see what's going on okay it's not just one thing it's putting them all together what do i mean by that well you're going to plan a route to go visit somebody okay well what do you have to do well first you have to know where you're going okay so you got to determine the location then you have to decide how you're going to get there so you got to go from place to place to place to place right from road to road to road to road to get there okay so direction of movement to the next stop on your location. Then you've got to orient yourself or reorient yourself at each of those locations. So, you know, I go down, I go west on a certain highway, and then I get off at a certain exit, and then I have to go to the left, and then I go three blocks, and then I have to go 
to the right, okay? And then deciding the best route is even more complex, right? Because there may be multiple ways that you can get there. You gotta have to deal with distances, complexity, the number of turns, the number, the speed limit, the number of traffic lights, the, maybe the number of left-hand turns that you have to do, the type of road you're gonna go on, okay? These days, we go to Google Maps and it does it, all that stuff for us, right? And so that's, I've, I've kind of alluded at the beginning of the lecture series that we were maybe losing some of our spatial thinking abilities and our spatial reasoning abilities because we're using technology instead. And that's definitely an example where I, I can see that happening. Hopefully you agree with me about that. All right. What about this role of distortion? And we mentioned that that's an issue. Said so talked about that as part of the framework a few times. Okay, and typically when we build some kind of a representation and deal with these transformations in our spatial thinking, they're they're what we call schematic. They're sort of a diagram. They're not all inclusive. They're not a complete one to one model of exactly what we're going to do but rather they de-emphasize some information and emphasize other information that we in our mind decided is important for us to solve this particular um, problem. And typically when we do that, it's, it's systematic, it's not random, okay? And it's driven by our organizing principles, our past experience, that leads to predictable distortions in our memory of how things are done and our judgment. Okay. So for example, one way our perceptions are organized is with geographic coordinates. Okay. So we know X, Y, and Z, we know latitude and longitude. Okay. So latitude and longitude is X and Y, and then Z is, is height or elevation. Okay. So we've got two horizontal and one vertical distance and direction and we've got these coordinates and we've known about them um, we've known about the cartesian coordinate system since we were you know in in uh, third grade or something okay and then we localize objects in the world approximately based on those axes and depending on where we live in the world we think about things a little bit differently okay and so we tend to remember things north and south and east and west and we don't remember things like north northeast and it, it, it's, it's just simple we simplify it right we make these systematic organizing principles that are actually not completely right but help us to deal with those things and so for example you know south america is perceived by most of us who live in north america to be basically right underneath um, North America to be aligned north and south. And, and if you look at it uh, really on the map, that, that's not true. Okay? But it's a simplification. It's a way of thinking about things. But it's a distortion. And distortions can help us to some extent, but tend to more hurt us in spatial thinking. Okay? What about the role of abstracts in spatial thinking? We talked about this or mentioned this. A little bit and so yeah we we use these metaphorically in everyday life i feel really close to that person that's a distance that's a spatial thing but we understand what we're talking about or i'm really excited i'm on top of the world okay everybody knows what that means or this person has lost her center <laughs> so these are metaphors that use spatial language but aren't talking about really spatial anything. Okay. We also use spatial thinking metaphorically in science, things like the periodic table in chemistry or flow diagrams for heat transfer or models of an atom. Okay. And so totally fine. It, again, hopefully you're seeing that almost everything you do has some kind of spatial component to it. Just most of the time, we're just not aware of it. And so what's cool about that is because we have a lifetime of experience in this spatial reasoning, which, you know, as we've shown before, is absolutely necessary if, if we're going to survive, 
Um, then we come to you know any discipline that we go, science discipline or whatever, with this spatial toolbox already, where we have these abstract concepts that we've already applied. The challenge for education, the challenge for those who want to do more spatial thinking, who want to improve their spatial thinking, is actually to transfer those life skills from one domain to another. And hopefully that's the main thing that you get out of these lectures is that you can do that. And if you think about it, and if your awareness increases, that's exactly what you're doing. Okay, what about the role of external spatial representations? Okay, so what, what's key with this? What, how do we make effective external representations? Okay. Well, they must convey really, really important conceptual information while getting rid of the irrelevant clutter and things that distract us, right? So these representations have to be precise without causing us have so much information that we get cluttered or distracted. And that's a lot harder than it sounds. And so here, think of this example. You know, what information should you put on a tourist map? So I'm going to make a tourist map of my town, which is world famous. And what do I want to put on there? Historic buildings? Sure. Museums? Absolutely. Restaurants, definitely. Bathrooms, maybe that should have been the first thing. Roads, hotels, rent a car places. You can see that the map gets cluttered really, really fast. Okay. And so, what is the most effective information that I have to have? And what becomes clutter? and distraction okay. subjective right it's not objective but it is important okay. all right let's talk about this a little bit the role of expertise so spatial thinking as in any kind of thinking any kind of cognitive competency in other words any way you can think there's differences among people some of us get it quickly some of us do parts of it well, some of us do none of it well, some of us do all of it well, okay, no big deal, okay? We know you can improve though, so don't lose track of that. But within every domain knowledge, in other words, with every discipline, there's going to be experts and there's going to be novices. And that's why we have to get training. That's why we have to build our experience. Different domains stress Spatial thinking, you would think in math, certainly in geography, you know, some of the natural resource kinds of sciences, they stress this idea of spatial thinking. Others, you know, maybe never, never mention it. And there's differences across age. Obviously, children think spatially differently than adults do. And so we can use this novice expert distinction to understand some of our differences in spatial thinking as shown on the next slide. Okay. So what's the key here? The key is to learn to extract the functional information from the spatial structures and to understand how and why something works. That's the whole goal of what we're trying to get. And spatial thinking is one way of doing that, a very, very powerful way of doing that, right? And so these different tasks, we can think of in terms of relative difficulty, okay? So the easiest things to do are to extract the spatial features. That has to do with this pattern description for identifying the different relationships, looking at the representations, putting them together in terms of parts and holes and that give rise to these patterns so we can see what's going on, okay? That's actually something you can improve on a lot. That is um, something that we will deal with with this exercise number three shortly, okay? Then we have to perform the spatial transformations. So we translate in space, 
We deal with scale transformations. We deal with rotations. Some of those things are easier than others. You know, imagining motions of different parts, actually moving the object, that can be pretty tricky. And then lastly, and most complex is, is drawing these functional inferences, okay? But those are key. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical. What, what, what good is doing all the other steps if you're not going to actually get something out of it, if you're not going to infer something out of it? Okay, so they're the most difficult and yet most central or important for establishing those temporal sequences and those cause and effect relationships. So that's where we got to get to. So that's absolutely super important. Yeah. So as far as those component tasks go, we understand that difficulty increases with dimensionality. So we said that we really want to get to a 3D understanding, but 3D is harder than 2D. So start with 2D and practice there and build yourself up to 3D. Okay, difficulty also increases as a function of data quality and quantity. So if we're missing some data where we have to kind of guess, we have to maybe interpolate if we're lucky, but often we have to make wild guesses where we're extrapolating because of the missing data, that makes things much more difficult. Or we might have error in the data or at least uncertainty in the data that we're using to try to do this spatial thinking. And as a result, that can cause issues. Again, think of Watson and Crick and uh, them coming up with the 3D structure for, for DNA, right? <laughs> that was just amazing. They had lots and lots of missing data they certainly had to extrapolate, and the, the data that they had uh, had lots of uncertainty in it, and yet they were able to spatially think through that, and that's amazing. You can try to represent data, the whole process, as a diagram. Okay? Sometimes it's easier to grasp the essential parts and their spatial relationships when you put it in a diagram. It's a little harder to understand the meaning and interpretation, especially more difficult when you try to get to the, the, the causal chain that the diagram is meant to convey, right? So we get a picture that helps us grasp some of the components of the spatial thinking of those spatial relationships, um, but it, it gets a lot more tricky when you're trying to get somebody to interpret what's going on or understand um, sort of the reasoning behind what you're what you're trying to communicate okay and that's where the novice and the expert really differ the more expertise you have the more you're going to be able to look at these diagram kinds of things and um, get the um, interpretation and the function and the causal chain out of it Okay, so diagrams are important, both whether you're a novice or whether you're um, an expert. So here's an example, right? Here's a, a heart. I don't know if you are an expert on how a heart works, um, but all the different pieces of the heart and, and all, uh, how it actually functions as a muscle and pumping blood um, through our bodies. But you could get a lot of labeling knowledge from this and the one on the right shows the direction of the blood flow and maybe that gives you more ideas about the function of what's going on but i think you would need a lot more than that or you'd have to have a lot more expertise to get too much more out of this diagram okay does that make sense so Spatial thinking is powerful, and hopefully you've gotten convinced that it gets more and more challenging. You go from description, which is pretty easy, to the analysis component, which starts to bring in this spatial reasoning to the point where you're actually solving problems, where you're inferring information from the description and then the analysis that you've put together. 
And absolutely, we know much about spatial thinking. We've learned tons of spatial thinking just from surviving. Okay? And we had to know spatial thinking in order to survive. The issue there is we're probably not aware of how often we think spatially. Okay? And we can improve our spatial thinking abilities. And lastly, spatial thinking can help us in our discipline. And there's this whole range of things that we need to understand that are discipline specific to the things that we care about. And then things that we learn in those disciplines can actually carry back to us in just our day-to-day -day living. So that's super useful. And so hopefully you're seeing how powerful this is. Okay. So I'd like you to do um, exercise number three, which brings a lot of what we talked about in this um, lecture together. Okay, so there's a short video that explains exercise number three. Please make sure you watch it um, as there's important explanations included in that video. I also provide you a PDF that gives you detailed instructions. You should read the instructions. Then there's the exercise, and then I actually give you the answers. Okay. But it's absolutely critical that you read the first page of the exercise so that you understand how to answer the 36 questions. So there's some explanation on the first page that basically goes through a couple of different examples of what you're going to do to answer the other 36 questions. And so you want to make sure you actually do this in order and actually um, understand what you're trying to do, what, what those examples help you understand before you actually try to do the exercise. So exercise number three is by far the most challenging exercise in this lecture series, but it's allowing you to do pattern recognition. It's allowing you to take these um, elements, what we call elements of image interpretation, like we just talked about size, shape, pattern, tones, context, all, all these different things, and try to identify um, specific objects. Okay? And then just like the other uh, exercises, there's some questions for you to consider when you finish. So the exercise should be fun. So try your best. But again, do not worry if you can't answer every single question. What's going to be really good for you is do your best to answer, put an answer down if you can come up with any answer at all. And then once you're done, look at the answers and then think about why that's the right answer and why you didn't get the answer correct. And that'll, again, help you build your spatial thinking. All right, well, enjoy exercise number three, and I will see you after you've completed this for the next lecture in the series. All right, take care.